Hello, my name is Shauna Gallant. I decided to explore the topic of the use of food as abuse in residential schools. This topic is of great interest to me as I had a grim fascination toward the Mohawk Institute located in Brantford because I would pass by it every time I would visit my Nana. Uh, the building always struck me as a surreal symbol of what Canadians should be ashamed of. Since I was a child, I have developed a passion for social inequality, so I felt that this topic was fitting. The importance of this topic lies in the legacy that it holds. Residential schools had a profound impact on everything, including food, as Chandra explains. We know that the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, the one close to my Nana's home, was called the Mush Hole because the children who attended the school became accustomed to the oatmeal mush they were served over and over again. Food historian Ian Mosby has documented the experiments conducted by the Canadian federal government within six of these residential schools between the 1940s and 1950s. He unveiled the nutritional neglect and abuse that was present in these schools and that has had a profound impact on generations of children. Ultimately, this is our history and we must all take responsibility. I argue that Aboriginal people continue to suffer as a result of the historical social position that they were subjected to and the current poverty that has resulted from their social standing within Canada. I support my stance as I examine past literature, analyze and critique the apology given in 2008 and the lack of recognition towards the continued display of inequality. The previous literature on this subject tells us that the residential school system was tremendously underfunded and documents present the impacts of residential school practices on the health and well-being of generations of Aboriginal children as they were stripped from their roots and their families. There was a trail of disease and death that swept within residential school walls that were caused by the construction, administration, and the poor funding. Edward from Onion Lake School explained the following in 1923. I'm going to tell you how we are treated. I am always hungry. Some sensitivity towards residential school students was often ignored. Many believed that the accounts of the children were merely to gain sympathy. However, it was clear that Edward and his classmates were not the first to endure the abuse of nutritional neglect and hunger. They ate cats or anything else that they could find. They even resorted to theft, which bred more abuse, according to Alvin Dixon, as he remembers his own hunger. For example, when a young female student stole a loaf of bread because she was struck with devastating hunger, her hair was cut off. Seams explains that there was not enough nutritional food to feed the children, often lacking in eggs, meat, fish, and potatoes. It has been established in previous literature that this hunger was systematic. Children were overworked and dangerously underfed. Therefore, they were susceptible to diseases such as tuberculosis. The Smithsonian study showed that poor diets and the unfamiliar foods that they were forced to eat were the culprit. Dr. Norquay said that the children that he treated from these residential schools were undernourished because of a lack of adequate supplies, mostly from their traditional roots, such as meat and fish. They were also victim to residential school and nutritional experiments. When Aboriginals entered residential schools, they were given white gifts instead of the traditional food that they were accustomed to. It wasn't just about the hunger. These white gifts included flour, sugar, lard, baking powder, salt, and milk. They were addictive and lacking in nutritional value. These were the connections to, to obesity, diabetes, and death for Aboriginals. In the long term, what was attributed to survival became unsustainable. Furthermore, the students in residential schools were not taught how to cook like their families. Therefore, each generation after them would not be taught. According to a survivor in the Donna Apavu lecture, he explained that, I can't cut up caribou meat, I can't cut up moose meats, work with fish, and speak my language. So I was starting to become alienated from my parents and my grandparents, everything. This quote shows that their food system was interrupted. 
because their food and health was tied to the traditions that was taken away from them. As you can see in these graphs, the first one shows um, the prevalence of diabetes between First Nations women, First Nations men, non-First Nations women, and non-First Nations men. You can see clearly the link between um, First Nations and non-First Nations. Across the board, First Nations are more likely to have issues with diabetes. Furthermore, you can see on the second graph that shows the rates of obesity, you can clearly see that um, Aboriginals and those that are on reserve are more likely to become overweight and obese. We can see that the distinction between residential schools and Aboriginals' health today is not random. If we look back at the apologies, for years the Canadian government avoided the subject. The government later set a fund of $350 million for healing purposes as a step to move forward from the legacy of physical and sexual abuse found in residential schools. However, as many pointed out that this initiative was not enough, I too believe that the initiatives by the federal government is not enough. The apologies that have been set out have lacked sincerity, and it has included a way to re-victimize the victims by essentially promoting to Canadians that Aboriginals carry a financial burden despite the government's actions. It also paints a picture that a simple apology can erase years of oppression. Furthermore, the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement that had the government commit to reconciliation with survivors never included any mention of the current health problems that survivors face today or any outline for initiatives to provide better health care to those that need it. It doesn't include any compensation for the hunger or malnutrition. This has failed to acknowledge one of the most impactful legacies that has come from residential schools, the use of food as abuse. These colonial and assimilation initiatives were formed through antiquated social and political environments that promoted social inequality towards Aboriginals. However, the lack of recognition that these health problems that our Aboriginals face today could be attributed to their time in residential schools is extremely upsetting. What these initiatives and the lack of recognition tell us about Aboriginals is that they are outsiders that carry a burden. They were and continue to be seen and treated as losers, the inferiors to the white people, essentially the winners. Without acknowledging our responsibility, we fail at ever making amends for the mistakes of the Canadian government and all of Canadians. In conclusion, through the support that I've presented, it is evident that Aboriginal communities continue to suffer from the results of the historical and social position that they were subjected to and the current standing of Aboriginals within our community. Despite the apology and weak initiatives that devalued the abuse, and the impacts endured as a result of oppression and assimilation, there is absolutely no way to make amends without acknowledgement and diligent action to improve the lives in these communities.